In this series of tutorials, we're going to do a couple of exercises. In the first one, we're going to use the selection tools to turn this photo into this composite. In our second exercise, we're going to work with this photo, and using our selection tools, we'll turn it into this. Let's begin with our first exercise. What I want you to do is navigate to the folder that you downloaded with the associated images. Let's come to the File drop-down menu, and we're going to select our first image. The one we're going to start with is this one here called Vegetable Set 3, and I'm going to click Open. Now before we do anything with this, let's take a look at this image's pixel dimensions. I'm going to come to the Image drop-down menu, and I'm going to select Image Size. In this dialog box, we see just how many pixels comprise this image. We see here that on its longest edge, it's just over 1100 pixels wide and almost 800 pixels tall. The resolution is at 72 pixels per inch, which we know from our past exercise is the resolution for an image that is meant to be seen on screen. What we see by these values is that this image would be appropriate for using as a background image on a web page, for example, but not for a printed poster. For our purposes, let's say we are making an image for web, and we will use this image's full pixel dimensions of 1160 by 772 at 72 pixels per inch. I'm going to say OK. I'm also going to zoom in just so that I can see this a little bit better by pressing Command plus sign on my keyboard. Now our first objective is to make a selection of the wooden table. We'll then use a little bit of masking to replace that wooden table with our concrete texture over here. Finally, we'll add some type and make it look like this. Along the way, we'll also look at using some layer effects to add drop shadows. I'm going to come back to our vegetable set image. Over in our toolbox, we have a few selection tools. If I click and hold on the marquee tool, you can see that we have some abilities to select geometric areas with our marquees. Of course, that won't work for our selection here, though. Underneath that, we have the lasso tools. The lasso tool at the top here allows me to make selections just by clicking and dragging with my mouse. Of course, that sort of selection style would be too challenging for us to do anything too complex. I'm going to get rid of that selection here by coming to the Select drop-down menu and selecting Deselect, or Command-D on our keyboard to get rid of a selection. There are some other sub-tools underneath that lasso tool. For example, the polygonal lasso tool works a little bit differently. It actually works in straight lines. If I was careful enough, I suppose I could go around the edges of my vegetables like so, clicking straight lines as I go. But again, this is not a very precise way of working. I'm going to double click to close that and then deselect it. But underneath those selection tools, we see this tool here, the quick selection tool. If I click and hold, you'll see that there is another sub tool underneath that called the magic wand tool. But for our purposes, the quick selection tool is the exact tool that we want to be working with. Here's a little interjection that's been recorded after I recorded the first part of this. It appears that the quick selection tool cursor doesn't display properly on my screen recording software. So what you're seeing here is not the way the tool normally displays. But you'll notice to the right I've created a graphic that will give you the relative size of that tool in the screen. As we proceed with this selection exercise, I'm going to resize this brush many times. Just look over at the graphic to see how large I'm actually making this brush. I'm going to select that tool from my toolbox, and you can see my selection tool cursor is a very small circle. I'm going to make that much larger by coming up here to the control panel, and you can see that currently my brush value size is 5 pixels. I'm going to click on that downward arrow, and I'm just going to increase that to something like 50. And now you can see the size of my brush is a little bit larger. Right next to this brush size indicator, though, you'll see that there are these three icons. One is just the image of the, the quick selection brush icon here, but one has a little plus sign above it, and one has a little minus sign. Those indicate the different modes of the way we can do selections. What I'm going to get you to do is click on this one with the plus sign above it. It's going to allow us to add to our selection every time we click with this tool, which is exactly what I want to do. And let me show you how we're going to begin. We are going to begin by using this brush tool on the inner part of the photo around the wood. And I'm just going to click and drag over top of the wooden part. And you can see what Photoshop is doing. It's using my current brush position 
and its size to determine what areas should be selected. What I don't want to do is go over top of any of the vegetables because that will accidentally select some of the vegetables. But you'll notice that even without going over some of the vegetables, for example, this tomato here was selected by accident. In fact, this onion over here was also selected. We're going to fix that in just a moment, but let's keep on going. I want you to do a rough selection to begin with, just a very quick pass over top of the wooden areas of the table, making sure not to go over top of the vegetables, but don't worry if some of the vegetables do get selected. And there I go. I've made a very quick, rough selection, the wooden part of my table. But it's, there's definitely some refining that needs to be done. For example, I still have some table that needs to be selected here, as well as some of the areas in between the vegetables up here also need to be selected. But I have a problem here where the tomato is selected when I don't want it to be. I'm going to zoom in to make this next process a little bit easier. I'm going to come over to my toolbox and I'm going to click on my magnifying glass or press Z on my keyboard, and I'm just going to click a couple of times to get into this area here. I can pan my document down just a little bit by clicking on the hand icon here in my toolbox and clicking and dragging down so I can see this a little bit better like so. I'm going to come back and select my quick selection tool. My quick selection tool is a little bit large at the moment though. I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. Again, I can do that by coming up here to the control panel and clicking on this disclosure triangle and using my size slider like that. But there is another way that I'd like to tell you about. That's using some keyboard shortcuts. If you press the left square bracket on your keyboard, your brush will get five pixels smaller. And what I'm going to do is make it so that my brush is just 10 pixels in size. Nice and small, but when it's small like this, I can get into smaller areas. But you can see what's happened here. By accident, it has selected this cucumber here. Let's talk about how we can unselect areas that we don't want to have selected. I could come back over here to my control panel and click on this icon here, the quick selection brush with the minus sign, but this would be tedious having to go back and forth like this. Watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave this quick brush selection with the plus sign selected, but I'm going to press on my keyboard the option button and you'll see that the plus sign now turns into the minus sign over here and when I have the minus sign selected that means I can deselect areas that have been accidentally selected. I'm going to make my brush even smaller to get into this area here. There I go. You may have to go over things a couple of times until you get it I'm going to make my brush as small as I can make it here. Well, with a little bit of care and attention, you can see that I have managed to refine my selection quite a bit. But I've had to make my brush very small indeed in order to do that. You can see I'm down to two pixels. I'm going to press my space bar and pan through my selection like this. I can see I need a little bit of refining on this edge here. Again, holding down my option button as I click inside of those vegetables to deselect the areas I don't want. Still missing a little bit of the table here. I'm just going to use my small brush. You can see it's a little bit of a dance back and forth between selecting and deselecting. I'm going to zoom out, position that in my screen. Now, once you feel like you have a decent selection, I want you to open up your layers panel. And you can see that we have currently just this one layer, and it's currently locked. I'm going to click once on that lock icon to unlock it, which allows us to do some things with it. Now, currently, what we have selected is the wooden part of the table. But the wooden table is the actual part of the image that I want to remove. So we have to do one more thing with this selection. I'm going to invert it so that rather than having the wooden table selected, I'm going to have everything else selected. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to come here to the Select drop-down menu, and I'm going to select Inverse. What has happened now is you can see that the marquee selection is now going around the vegetables. 
Now that I have those vegetables selected, I want to save this selection, just in case I have to reload it again in the future. So I'm going to come to the Select drop-down menu, and I'm going to select Save Selection. And for the name, I'm just going to choose Vegetables, so that I know what this selection is referring to. I'm going to say OK. I could deselect it and reload it at any time. But let's proceed here with this still selected. I'm going to come back here to the Layers panel. I'm going to add a mask to this layer. Let me show you what I mean. At the bottom of this Layers panel, you can see that there is this icon here. It looks like a white square with the black circle in the middle. That is our Add Mask icon. If I click that once with that layer selected, I'm now no longer seeing the wooden part of that table. That gray and white checkerboard pattern is what's called our transparency grid. Whenever we see that, we know that we are now working with some transparency. Now what we've just done is created a mask of the image. And we can see that in our Layers panel, that there is now a mask associated with that layer. I've talked about masks before in our Texture in Illustrator tutorials. The masks in Photoshop work in exactly the same way. Black pixels conceal the image, and white pixels reveal the image. I can select the mask here in the Layers panel, but you'll notice I don't see the mask. If I want to see that mask, I can, if I hold down my Option button, and then click in that mask window in the Layers panel, I can enter in to that mask. And you can see how this mask has been applied to the image. The black pixels are hiding that photo. I'm going to come back to the image by clicking once on that image thumbnail in the Layers panel. Remember, what I want to be seeing is the concrete underneath. Let's place our concrete photo into this document. We're going to come to the File drop-down menu, and I'm going to select from this menu, Place Embedded. From this set of photographs, I'm going to choose Concrete underscore 06 and choose Place. I'm going to zoom out just so I can see this a little bit better, Command minus sign. I now have this placed texture, but you can see it's not quite the right size. I'm going to resize this just by clicking once on the bounding box anchor point on the top right and drag up and I'm going to click on the bounding box anchor point on the left and drag down. To accept that change, I can press Enter or Return on my keyboard, or I can just click on this checkbox right there. I now need to reorder this in the Layers panel. I'm going to open up my Layers panel, and yes, you can see that my concrete layer is now above everything, but I'm going to click on that and drag it below. And you can see that the mask of the vegetable layer is now allowing us to see through to the concrete layer below. The issue I'm having right now, though, of course, is that it doesn't look right. There's no shadows being cast by the vegetables onto the concrete below. Let's fix that. I'm going to click once on my vegetable layer, and I'm going to come to my Layers drop-down menu, and from Layer Style, I'm going to choose Drop Shadow. I'm just going to move this off to the side here a little bit. The Drop Shadow has some interesting features. First of all, the blend mode, I'm going to suggest you leave as multiply. The blend color is currently set to black. You can leave it at black. We have the opacity slider here that allows us to determine how dark those shadows can get. I'm going to bring mine up just a little bit. Underneath that, we have a angle that determines the direction that the light is coming from. From the original photo, it was coming from the left and slightly from above, like that. Underneath that, we have some sliders here that determine how far that shadow travels from the original object. We don't want to go too far. You can see that there will become a point where it will start to break down just a little bit. I'm going to leave it roughly like that. Underneath that, we have this spread value. Spread value just determines how much shadow we see before it starts to fade off into transparency. Finally, this value here, size, determines just how soft-edged that shadow is going to be. I'm going to let you determine the values that you like. You can see the values that I'm using here. Once you have them looking the way you want, select OK. The final thing that I want to do here is put in the City Farms type. I'm going to come back over here to my toolbox and select the Type tool, and I'm going to click once in my artboard. Now the type that shows up here again is that lorem ipsum dummy type. The font face that shows up for you may be different than it is for me. What I have selected here is something called Futura Condensed Medium. The type currently is defaulted to 72 points, but I'm going to make mine much larger in just a moment. But before I do that, I'm going to type in the words City Farms. I'm going to press my caps lock and type in City Farms. 
When I come back over to my toolbox and select my Move tool, you'll see that a bounding box now appears around that type. If I click and drag on the corner bounding box anchor, I can resize this type and then reposition it into the center of my screen like that. Currently, my type is white. You may have a different color for yours. You can always change that by selecting your type tool and highlighting your text. And from the control panel, you'll see that there is a text color swatch. By clicking on that, you can choose the color that you want to make it here. Again, I want you to choose white. We'll say OK. There's just one more thing that I wanted to do with this type. If I come back here to my demo, you'll notice that the type has got a bit of texture to it, as if the paint that made up the type has slowly worn away. Let's come back here and do the same thing. The way we do that is by coming over to the Layers panel and making sure that we have the City Farms type layer selected. I'm going to double click this layer, but I'm going to make sure that I double click it, not over top of the name, which would cause me to rename it, but I'm going to double click it over here on the right hand side of that layer. And when I do, that opens up this layer's Layer Styles panel. Now we were just looking at the Layer Styles a moment ago when we added the drop shadow to the vegetable layer, but we're going to do something a little bit different here. Over here, there's a number of things that we can check, but I want you to take a look at this bottom category here, Blend If Gray. If I click on that, you can see we can choose some other values, but I want us to stay here with gray. And this effect is more easily seen than described, but essentially what's going to happen is we are going to make this layer, the City Farms type layer, blend with the visible layers underneath it, in this case, the concrete. And I can do that by clicking on this slider point right here underneath Underlying Layer. And I'm going to click and drag to the right, closer to the center. And as I do, you can start to see that the underlying layer is now starting to peek through. This is what the Blend If slider does. It tells the layer that I'm currently working with to blend with the underlying layers if, for example, the underlying layer's pixels are dark enough. Now, I don't want to drag it too far because I could eventually make that type disappear completely. But there's a value right around here that I think looks pretty good. I'm going to say OK. I'm going to use my zoom tool to zoom in just a little bit just to reveal what's going on. If I wanted to, I could come over to my toolbox and choose my move tool. And you can see how when I move that type around, the underlying dark pixels are showing through. I'm going to hit command minus sign to zoom out. I want you to save this with your name on it and then export a JPEG version by coming to the file drop down menu and selecting export and then export as. From here, we can choose our format options. Again, I want you to choose JPEG. We'll leave the size as it is because it's not that big. And then we'll just choose export all. Put my name on it. And that is the JPEG file that I would like you to submit.